song. Great. Thank you, Pastor David, for the he came over. Nobody like you. Nobody like you. <laughs> they were over at the house yesterday rehearsing that, and it was just beautiful to hear them interact. Uh, of course, David has been, and I've been friends for 30 years, I guess. And he's traveled with me all over the world and produced our great Azusa albums and all the series and the ministry of our churches and the Azusa conferences and sang and written and done so much for so many. He's just a pretty much of a musical genius just in so many ways. Thanks, Gabe, for on the drums. Every week. Dorothy, love you so much, sweetheart. I was just sitting here thinking while all was going on, how many times, uh, uh, how, how life has shifted, changed in the most incredible ways that we're all here together today and singing and worshiping and clapping and interacting and I love the statement in the in the program that you or the bulletin that you may have seen by Alice Walker they came to church to share God not find God many people go to church to find God but we regularly come here to interact and to share and to, inter, to interchange uh, our expressions of God our own divinity sharing with others to seek is is to ready one's self for discovery as well as recovery of anything that seems missing, broken, or lost. If we are spiritual seekers, what are we seeking? Why are we seeking? And why do we have a sense or need to seek or to want or to desire or to sense that we lack something for which we seek? Spiritual seeking means basically to transcend the illusion of isolation or alienation or lack and to seize the present or seize what is presented and to do that with power and to do it with dignity and to do it with a sense of ultimate resolution. If you ask somebody, why are you here? Not only just on the planet, why did you come to church today? Why do you go to church any day or any way? What do you do when you think? How do you, how do you self-medicate? Self-medication and self-meditation are first cousins. In the ancient days and ways, people meditated to find ways to medicate anything that seemed out of sync, out of syncopation, out of cadence, or had backed into decadence, death. You're always trying to fix or find or even if you will fondle your spirit. You want to feel good about you. It's all about self-expression, self-experience, self-exposure. Why do I feel the way I feel? Whether it's having a glass of wine, which some of you do and drink ye all of it. <laughs> and so do I. And or having a piece of chocolate cake or a banana split or some really good sleep or really good laugh or really good song 
or some kind of experience where you transcend anything that is uncomfortable for you. Spiritual secret. Spirit is the non-physical part of, of a person. It's the seat of emotions and character. The soul, Greek word is suke, English word psyche or psychology. Your thought life. I believe animals have spirits as well. The, 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 in the Greek words, spirit is pneuma, where we get the word pneumatic or pneumonia or pneumon, which is the Greek word for lung. Has to do with breath or breathing. Your essence, your ether. When Jesus says you must be born again, the Greek word for again is anothen, where we get the English word another. Some translations say you must be born from above, other ether. An esoteric reality outside of physicality. You must elevate your or transcend any wall of thought that prevents you from experience seeing your total accurate self. What Nicodemus said, master or teacher, rabbi, we know you are a teacher sent from God for no one could do these miracles except God be with him. And that's when Jesus said, hmm, you must be born again. Because you just picked up something that only spirit could convey. He wasn't saying you must be, you got to be saved. He was saying you must have transcended, you must have had a birth in the ether. When I was a kid, they used to smoke ether. Chuck Tissel, have you ever smoked ether? No, I'm kidding. I don't, I don't know what that is, but we sniffed glue. I didn't, but my brother did. You, you 50, 60 folks remember sniffing glue, and now people snort cocaine, or they take a... Whatever that is, to get somewhere to desensitize themselves from one reality and transcend to another. Talk to me, somebody. Traditionally, spirituality is associated with our intuitive experiential approach to religion. Folks go to church because they call themselves spiritual. <laughs> we Pentecostals believe in transcendence, literally going into a trance. Escaping one reality or transcending one or transisting to another place, another space where we feel more comforted or comfortable. The reason so many people take drugs is not just because they want to get high, though they do, but they want to, to be ethereal. They want to be born again. Not a religious experience, but a spiritual experience. We want the ether. We want the otherness of ourselves. We want what we really want is to bridge our humanity to our divinity. You want to get that in-between state. We're not just human beings looking for spiritual experiences. We are spirit having an earthly encounter. We have a mind, we have a body, but we are ether. We are spirit. And that's what we're homesick for, whether it's Buddhism, Hinduism, Islam, Judaism, Christianity, even various aspects of Wiccan, uh, what they call Wiccan witchcraft, or it's not an evil thing, it's people who love to hug a tree and get in touch with nature. And ancient African spiritism, it embraced the oneness of humanity, divinity, and nature. Humans, gods, animals, animism, trees, that they're all inextricably connected. And all religions embrace some form of that. How can I be one with who I am? Isn't it interesting that in the scriptures it says that everything God created was good. The only time it says God says something wasn't good is when he said it is not good that humankind should be alone. The, the most ancient ache of the heart is aloneness. We want to be connected. We want to be attached to, 
not bound by, but bound to. I want to be part of you because I miss you. And I know that as we say universalism, you are a verse in my unit. Universe, one verse, version or versification of the whole. You are sitting next to a version of yourself. Or a verse in yourself. Or a versification of who you are. We have the social desire for each other. I miss you. And you know you miss me. (laughs) Because I love me as you present me. You remind me of something that I am and something that I might not be. Talk to me, somebody. So, we are recapturing a non or less physical reality. That's what we want. Something we inherited, as I said, in the ancient African spiritism, the concept or belief that God, nature, and humankind were inextricably connected and that God, spirit, or before God was called God, God was called force or source. Before words, and words are spelled, but words also cast spells. Semantics. Everybody thinks marriage is about sex. Marriage is about union and about commitment and about covenant. Those of you who are married realize how little sex has to do with it. (laughs) But it's because sex is so powerful and so potent. When it's right, it's right, and you can, you can handle it. You know, you, that's, if, you, if you consider 100% of what relationship is, you got to work, you got to eat, you got to manage, and you're happy when you can have that, that special intimate time. 20, 22 years I've been married to that lady. I love the intimacy of our relationship, but that's not what the relationship is built on, physical intimacy. It's spiritual intimacy. It's when I feel connected to her. Women will always say, and my wife at least does, I just want connection. I just want connection. I just want to be connected to you. It's like, man, you're sleeping up here with me. What do you mean? But (laughs) she's not talking about physical alone. She's talking about the into me see that I see in her, she sees in me, that she is a version of me. And I'm a version or verse of her. And that that unity is profound and sound and I'm spiritually seeking everything I do, whether it's enjoying a meal, preparing a meal, my spirit is active. My essence is active. I like, when I go into the kitchen, one of the things I love about going to the kitchen is when I go in there, my grandmother shows up. She's been gone since 1960, my mother's mother, she's been gone since 1964, my aunt, who was 97 when she transitioned, she shows up, my godmother was 90, she just left. Some of all them old saints with crooked stockings on it. <laughs> the little sweet people that I grew up, the, the guardian angels that I first met when I got here, they still show up and I can hear them talking to me. Put a little bit of sugar, baby. Just put a little, no, put just a little pinch of that. And a little squinch of that. And I can smell the kitchen. I can smell the perfume. I can see, I can feel. It's like they all show up in the kitchen. I like going into the kitchen. Whether I'm doing salmon or pig feet, it all runs together. (laughs) And they show up. I I, I actually transcend a pathos. I transcend a pain. I seek myself in a neck bone. I seek myself in a tuna sandwich. Talk to me somebody. I seek myself in my mother's hot water cornbread. My dad's gone, so we're more attached to mom now. I've always been attached to my mom, but that that my dad is physically gone. There's a whole nother desire I have for my mom because I remember my dad when I hug my mom and when I look in the mirror, I see myself. Sometimes I'm like my dad looking out. You know, and some some of the questions I ask is, when you see something, who's looking? Who's observing what you see? Is your spirit looking out of your eyes? Is your divine self observing your human self? Are they working and walking in syncopation? Is the drumbeat of the soul and the drumbeat of the self the same drumbeat of the spirit? 
No one so close to us, and I lost my godmother who helped raise me, my uncle, my dad's baby brother, my dad, in three-month period. I'm still wrestling with their exit, but not their absence. Because they're more present now in the memories of my soul, myself, and my cells, that it's as if they're not even gone, or that I went to where they are. Or that I experienced myself at a whole different level. Turn to someone and say, I see you in me. I see me in you. <laughs> see, in African spiritism, there was no concept of death in the ancient African spiritual life. Just, just the continuation of life in other dimensions. That's the respect for ancestors, which eventually became a type of ancestral worship. Mama Nam. Mama Nam. My mother used to. My dad used to. I heard my mother say... My grandmother used to say, my school teacher used to say, my godmother used to say, my great grandfather used to say, it's like they're there. You hear them again. Mama always said, daddy always said, mama said there'd be days like this, there'd be days like this, my mama said. In other words, you're saying to yourself, okay, you're not shocked, you're not surprised, mama told you some shift would take place. Shift, 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 shift. Spell it right. And use it however it works for you. You've heard me say many times, shift happens. Turn to them and say, shift happens. I'm trying to get my shift together right now and keep it together. So knowing a oneness, actually that's the birth of Unitarianism. Unitarianism, in the original mystical minds that came up with the terminology and the concept that has developed into a religion or an organization or, or, or creedless denomination, <laughs> it actually was a belief that we are all inextricably connected. We're all one. That's why you can go into a, a Walgreens and see somebody you've never seen before and will never see again and connect with them chemically. It's like there's a chemistry between you and that person. You could have actually lived your life with that person or you knew them in another life or you felt some kind of connection. You will never see them again, but you were very comforted by them. They reminded you of an aspect of yourself. Sometimes when I'm watching The Animal Planet, <laughs> I see some terrible things that happen in there and I think that's the only hell you go through. You come back and you become a, a duck that gets chewed up or something. <laughs> that makes more sense than eternal damnation, but... I told you my family and I were coming from, from somewhere in Kansas and we went through some animal park here, I don't remember where it was, between here and Kansas and, and um, we opened up the, the van and Majesty and Julian were really small, these big old buffaloes and, 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 and longhorn cows, they would literally stick their big faces in the car. And some of them looked so familiar I thought, <laughs> you used to go to my daddy's church. I knew you was going to hell now. He up in here begging for me and you didn't get my daddy no offering. You know, I thought <laughs> there was something in their eyes that like they were saying, don't you remember? I'm Deacon Jones. <laughs> that, was a, it was, that was sort of a weird experience that most people who are sane would not have shared that with you, but I just did. All we humans have a genetic and spiritual memory or library, where we, we all know that, that, that we have, everything that we've ever known or experienced is archived. Do you ever have like a, like a deja vu, like, wow, geez, I've been here, that happened. It's like, it's in the, the library of the soul. It's in the, the archival memory of your cells. And, you, and when, you, when you reconnect with those memories, you're not so shocked by the present. It's like, I got this. I signed up for this. I think I volunteered to come here. I'm not a victim of circumstances or of destiny or of creation. I chose, I actually agreed, I entered a contract, I volunteered to come here and I'm always trying to remind yourself, every desire you have is something you miss that you've had before. Whether that's perfect love, unconditional love, security, this certain, this certain feeling that you are really divine and anybody says you're other than that, it insults you and you might hit them. 
or hide from them or run from them or avoid them or you might rob them. Any, and I've said many times, many of the people in prison are there because they know something that they don't believe. You, you don't believe you're wealthy, but you know you are in your spirit, in your cells. In other words, you know that you're not without covering or without care. You're not really unprotected. But when you think you are unprotected or believe you're unprotected, you grab a gun. Because you know you're supposed to be secure, but you can't transcend to the place where you're certainly comfortable with that knowledge. You believe that somebody's out to get you. Hear me what I'm saying. You believe that somebody is your enemy. You believe that somebody is opposed to you or somebody is demeaning and something rises up in you and you're going to defend yourself because you know you're not supposed to be threatened, but you believe that something is threatening you and you wrestle with what you believe and what you know. Turn to someone and say, I know I'm cool. I know I'm free. Our cells remember who they are. And they don't, they don't need to be taught their physiological function or purpose. Same is true of our organs, our feet, our hands, our legs. They know who they are. We are spiritual beings manifesting as human and expressing and experiencing humanness. We are on the inside looking out. Does that make any sense to you? You're observing. It's like you're up here. They call them out-of-body experiences. And you're watching them. You're watching yourself fuss and fight and feud over there. You're totally at peace here. And you want to communicate to your human. You don't need to panic. Pan is the Greek word for fear. You don't need to be afraid. Also panora pa panoramic all the way around. In Hebrew, the word for the face of God or the head of God is, is, is pawn and it has to do with the fact that you can see all the way around. You're fine. You've got this. You know you're okay. Why are you freaking out? Why are you upset? Why are you breaking down? You know you're fine. When you start breaking down and freaking out, it's because you have believed the lie, but you know you're okay. You know you've got it. So why are you, why are you freaking out over here? You're up here saying, hey! Connect, connect, connect with your divinity. You're okay. Turn to them and say, you're fine. You're perfectly fine. You're all right. You look good. You are good. You feel good. You know good. But you don't believe it. You believe the illusion. You materialize the illusion. You create your own monsters. The monster under the bed is not really there. Or if it is, name it and go on about your business. You're bigger than your own fear. And it lied to you and told you, you need to get upset. 96% of all there is to know is called dark science or dark knowledge. We live off of 4% and we, we do fairly well. They call it dark knowledge, dark space. It's out there. It's either unknown or unknowable. 96% of all there is to know is dark. It's out there. And when you meditate, and of course, the, the ancient shaman and, 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 and mediums and priests and, 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 and uh, uh, messianic type people would go to a place where they would meditate so they could hear and see and feel. And out of the meditation came the medication. It would be an herb or a compound that they would go through and find. A poultice, as, the old, as my aunt used to say. Go out there and get me a poultice. It was natural, or it was nature cooperating with nurture. And so the shaman or the mediums, and we all are involved in seances all the time. With a medium, you're trying to contact something you think is dead, or gone, or dying. I actually met with a medium. I, I, I met a medium at breakfast, not to ask her to mediate for me, but she was one of the speakers at a conference I went to, and she was actually concerned about her presentation that night. People actually pay her to contact somebody that's gone. Now, I didn't go that far, but I would have been, I wouldn't have left if she started telling me my daddy was standing behind me. Because I lost him so recently, does daddy coming through? Actually, daddy does come through to me all the time. 
just as real. I don't need the medium in that sense because my dad is right here in the breath that I breathe. My, my immutable, immortal, immeasurable, immediate self is my dad and your dad and anybody you think is gone. They're all in here. You've heard me say several times that you're, you're breathing the dust of the people who were in the service before you. The skin. 90% of dust in anybody's home is human skin. I know that it's called yucky. Oh my God. Well, you the human whose skin is that? It is. <laughs> you and Mama Nam and the relatives of your family, you're constantly evolving. So we are mist and mystical and mysterious and secret and sacred. And we're transcending to that knowledge. Wrap your hands around yourself. I got to stop. Life is both experience and experiment. One of the most sacred mantras in the human spirit is the term Om or Om or I am or Amen. There's certain vibrations in those intonations. And we do it all the time like we go, mm, um, every time you think you don't know, you go, um, let me see, um, 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 um. You're actually connected, connecting to another dimension when you say that. It's the same as saying, I am. It's a certain vibration that syncopates with your spirit. And people do it inadvertently. When we say, Amen, 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 you're actually saying, I am, I am, I am, um. Music is that. When you hear the music and you say, oh, oh, your sounds and echoes and, and, and acoustics. Remember, faith cometh by hearing. The word is a cool, hearing, acoustics. The reverberation, re reverberations, the resonation, resound or repetitions of your soul. Sometimes we sing the song over and over. We beat the drum. It's like, it's like a, 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 a syncopation and a synchronicity that comes together. And you're penetrating, breaking the, the membrane and coming from one dimension to another and transcending yourself and your soul. It's powerful. And you can experience that in every area of your life. Hug you one more time. And let me hear you say, oh, 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 oh. I used to hear my mother praying in the morning, every morning. She would, when she'd get up before us going to work, she'd be in the bathroom. Oh, yeah. Oh, oh Jesus. Oh, yeah. My mom. Ain't no, wasn't no music in there but her. She was praying. <laughs> I have a Hindu friend that used to listen to his grandmother in London. She would be going through her rituals of prayer. She'd have a little prayer room. Panash Desai. His grandmother, he would hear his grandmother going through her, her East Indian Hindu almost Zen Buddhistic ways of oh, oh, ah, ah. <laughs> Brings all kind of stuff up, doesn't it? Now, take a deep breath in, please, everybody. Breathe it out. It's like, ah, that is good. Mm, that's what life is. From now when somebody asks you something, I'm trying to remember to say, life is good. Say it. Good. Come on, say it again. Life is good. Life Come on, say it one more time. Life is good. Life is That's good. like saying life is God. You're good. Let me ask you, you good? good? You're basically saying you're God and you are. You good? Yeah, I'm good. Tell somebody, ask somebody, you good? good. High five and say, yeah, I'm good. I'm good. I'm God, you God, we all God. This is all good. We're working this thing out together. Hey! You're my brother, you're my sister. So take Thanks for tuning in online. We are so pleased with all the different people who have been tuning in from all over the country and all over the world. 
to our ministry and what we're doing at All Souls here in Tulsa. If you have a chance to send me an email or connect with me in some way, let me know what you're finding, why you tune in, and what you're getting out of it. I would love to hear from you. I'm always pleased when I get messages from different people who tell me all kinds of things about the impact of All Souls Tulsa's ministry on them and their lives and their families. And if you get a chance to make a gift to support this ministry, to become a partner, we would love to partner with you and have you be a friend of the church and somebody who is actually supporting us to create this congregation and the world that we're trying to create together. You can be a part of it, and every gift of every amount makes a difference. We really appreciate your support.